Hi, it's Dwight again. Today I want to talk to you about the political economy of the Nordic countries. Uh, that's Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and of course Sweden. Uh, Denmark is properly called the Kingdom of Denmark. It was unified as a kingdom in about the 10th century as a very proficient seafaring nation, you know, in, in line with the Viking heritage. Uh, the Constitution of Denmark itself was signed on June 5, 1849, which ended an absolute monarchy that had begun in 1660. Uh, the Republic of Finland was from the late 12th century until 1809, was part of Sweden. Uh, but the Finns won't admit to that, mostly. It then became the Grand Duchy of Finland, an autonomous duchy within the Russian Empire, until the Russian Revolution, which prompted the Finnish Declaration of Independence in 1917. According to the Landnamabok, the settlement of Iceland began in A.D. 874, when the first Norwegian chieftain, Engolfia Anansen, became the first permanent settler on the island. I apologize for mangling any of these names. From 1262 to 1918, Iceland was ruled by Norway and then later by Denmark. The country became independent in 1918 and a republic in 1944. The Kingdom of Norway was established in 872. And originally one of the, one of the petty kingdoms, uh, there were small kingdoms of, 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 the, of the Nordic region, of the, uh, the, the seafaring region. Norway is one of the oldest still existing kingdoms, so it has a very long history. Uh, between 8, 1661 and 1814, uh, Norway was an absolute monarchy, and since 1814, it has been a constitutional monarchy. Sweden emerged as an independent and unified country during the Middle Ages. In the 17th century, the country expanded its territories to form the Swedish Empire, this empire grew to be one of the great powers of, of Europe in the 17th and early 18th century. Give you a little bit of the history there just to show that this area has been established for a long time. There's a lot of history here. And that history tends to play out in, in, in business government relations today. And we're going to get to that a little bit more. Uh, the Nordic economies pursue what your author calls the employee dignity agenda, which I don't think is, is too bad of a way of phrasing it. Uh, Nordic variety of capitalism is widely discussed as not only a model, but for a highly successful one. Uh, folks of a left-leaning uh, orientation tend to look at the Nordic economies as proof that socialism will work somewhere uh, someday. In the Nordic countries, a cross Party consensus supports high taxation rates, a large public sector, and a powerful social welfare system. Uh, some of the students who are listening to this right now have benefited from that rather greatly. And JCU, therefore, has benefited from it. The Nordic approach to management education has also traditionally emphasized human dignity, quality of work life, and teamwork and collaborative approaches between management and unions. Uh, our whole concept, for example, of self-managed work teams was lifted holus bolus from uh, Volvo. And those of you who've heard me speak about uh, organizational research before, the first seminal research on organizational culture all comes out of the Scandinavian area. Nordic society features very low levels of income inequality, and a majority of the population do consider themselves middle class. Despite their small populations, these countries have strong reputations in science and academia, and many of the multinationals originating from the region produce well-known and high-quality products for the national marketplace. But confidence in the Nordic economies was shattered uh, during the, by a banking crisis in the early 1990s and necessitated widespread bailouts. Uh, and Scandinavian multinationals have a problem, too, that all small country multinationals do, that once you've outgrown your home and many have therefore been acquired by overseas investors and restructured for best, best practice and shareholder value, no longer so much with that social agenda that Nordic companies are known for. The Nordic countries came to industrialization rather late. They were still quite agricultural, even up until the, you know, some, some of them in the early 20th century. Although they are known as traders, you know, because of uh, of their their large coastlines, 
Uh, many of these uh, countries were members of the German Hanseatic League, you might recall. So the, the idea of trading and seafaring and exploring has been going on there for centuries. And that contributes to their understanding of, of, of the way economies tend to work. Norse epic poems, or what are called sagas, many of which were composed in the 1200s, record the founding of Viking settlements and conquests in, England, in Iceland, Greenland, Britain, and northern France, that is the Norman region of France, between the 8th, 9th, and 10th centuries. But with small populations providing limited domestic market size, all of the Nordic nations expended great efforts on export earnings to stimulate growth. Uh, hence some of them having colonies, you know, in far-flung places and still engaging in global trade. The major industrial leap forward for the Nordic economies came towards the middle to late 19th century and up until the First World War. They were kind of latecomers to the beginnings of commercialization and industrial revolutions. Uh, they started scaling back tariffs and duties in, in the late 1800s, 1860 to 1870. But they started emphasizing about the same time schooling and education and developed very high literacy rates, which gave them a very skilled workforce. By the 1900s, Scandinavian banks had grown rapidly, provided investment funding for corporate expansion. Kind of that, uh, that home bank, that house bank model that the Germans use very similar. So if you look at Germany's late industrialization strategy, to some degree, Sweden, Denmark, and Norway pursued something very similar. Labor relations in the early 20th century were extremely troublesome. I mean, you wouldn't think about that now, but you'd have to know some Nordic history, particularly in Sweden. With powerful unions and powerful employer associations, labor peace was won only after decades of an intense class conflict. Uh, strike breakers were common, industrial riots were quite common, and that was one of the reasons that these countries went to the form of industrial legislation they have now. But eventually those compromises between labor and capital were found and led to decades of peace. Being peripheral to Europe, you know, peripheral, let's put quotation marks around that, had some advantages. All of the Scandinavian countries, for example, stayed out of the First World War and avoided, you know, the, the destruction that came with that and the setback for their economies. Social democratic parties with close links to trade unions became the dominant electoral force across all these countries since the 1930s. In the Second World War, uh, Sweden remained neutral, but was nevertheless forced to develop rationing, price and investment controls, and developing a war economy of a kind. Norway and Denmark were occupied, and Finland established state control of the economy during its conflict with the USSR. Uh, so the, the, these countries have long been uh, worried by their neighbors, shall we say. Uh, the post-war heyday of the Nordic model might be called living in the people's home, the people's house, is what the Swedes call their, uh, their parliament. In keeping with many of the nations in that post uh, ex post war expansionary period of the economy, Scandinavian economies preferred full employment and developed especially powerful forms of government welfare. A uh, cradle to the grave protection is quite common there. It was during this period that those famous features of the Scandinavian model f suddenly started to show themselves. Uh, in 2000, the typical publicly listed firm on the Stockholm Stock Exchange had a clearly identified majority owner and 82.2% of listed firms had a clear owner with more than 25% of the votes. Uh, those either family-owned firms or owned by industrial combines or had, again, a central bank that was part of their, uh, part of their investor uh, mix. They generally demonstrate relatively high levels of productivity, at least before the problems of the 70s and 80s set in. But this is likely to be by some, I, by, by some thoughts, a, a product of uh, job satisfaction, that because of, of the relative labor peace, that the uh, productivity levels were, were able to climb because there were no interruptions. There were widespread demands for greater work autonomy, though, with the outcate, outbreak of wildcat strikes in the 1960s, which again led to the peaceful model we have now and a lot of uh, workplace participation and employee dignity, employee democracy where the workers' councils have a large say in how a company is run. Uh, 
but it can be regarded that by many of those actually living and working under it as oppressive and alienating because uh, of the demand for conformity and the idea that consensus comes at a cost. Although the, the Scandinavian economies do tend to be more entrepreneurial than most of Europe. It might be just because they're small size, but it might also be because workers dissatisfied working with large, within large corporations tend to go off and seek their own fortunes. So, although the parties of the right enjoyed some electoral success in the late 70s, early 80s, there was no Reagan or Thatcher moment during this period. But if you looked at them now, you'd see that there have been some challenges. In the 1990s, the Nordic economies broke significantly from other organized models, but largely because of a broad employer counterattack in which firms demanded reforms because they saw the workforce becoming more abundant and the restrictive and counterproductive employment laws, overly powerful unions, made it increasingly hard for the companies to be profitable on an international scale. In fact, you'll find in, in a number of these countries, there's a lot of informal practices that go on to prevent employers having to adopt workers into the whole social welfare model. There's a lot of informal uh, part-time uh, part employment, for example, that goes on. And while the government knows it's happening and could probably put a stop to it, they tend to choose not to. In During, you know, the, the last half of the, the last a uh, couple of decades of the 20th century, the social spending in, in the Nordic economies, with the exception of Norway, was becoming an increasing burden uh, that the, 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 the government spending at one point reached two-thirds of its peak of, of GDP in the early 1980s. And so they had uh, the same inflation that the rest of the industrial world had and what was happening there is that it was seen as, as a wage price spiral. Increasing demands from the unions kept increasing prices. <coughs> so the ideological consensus behind the Nordic model has been gradually evaporating throughout the 1980s and, and up until the, you know, the current years. <coughs> So Nordic Social Democrats moved to occupy the center ground. They saw what was taking place in the rest of the world, particularly Britain and the U.S., and, and made their moves as well. Uh, the, 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 one, one of Sweden's, uh, well, Sweden's uh, center-left party, SAP, effectively began to embrace neoliberalism as it turned to the so-called Third Road, which became the third way under Tony Blair in Britain, as you know. First growth, then redistribution was kind of their motto. But it became, this, the, as I said, the inspiration for the third way adopted across uh, for the Labor Party in, the, in uh, the UK and Bill Clinton's administration in the US. So the governments were increasingly attracted to neoliberal policy measures to restore economic growth because you know, they, they saw that uh, regulation was uh, stagnating the economy, strangling growth. So they embraced deregulation and globalization. The financial sectors in particular grew substantially and suddenly there was much more activity and liquidity, which unfortunately tends to create bubbles. Uh, that bubble began to burst in around 1991 with, with a rapid decline in real estate prices. But Norway took the most dramatic actions. What happened there was you know, they, they actually uh, got directly involved in the economy and of course, they've got that massive uh, sovereign wealth fund uh, that, that's uh, funded by oil revenues. So what happened was they, they made the correct choices. They made the painful decisions, even though some of their citizens were unhappy. The Swedish GDP fell 5% from 1991 to 93. Unemployment grew around at 10%, which was unheard of. The Finnish economy contracted for three straight years and unemployment reached 20% in 1994. But they made, the, as I said, the correct decisions and the economies have been largely stable ever since. Although there are some other things happening which I'll get to. Uh, so the crash triggered cutbacks in the social spending and government spending full stop. They actually decreased the size of government, adopting a new public management style. And of course, the crash also provided the impetus for Sweden to join the EU, which 
moved it uh, again away from national planning because if you're as we've just talked about the EU rules they tend to at least on the surface uh, tend towards uh, a, a, a neoliberal model of industry regulation so what happens is a lot of the major firms are going toward this idea of investor capitalism and shareholder value logic and that's been moving on but it's particularly it's crucial to remember that significant portions of the, of the economy remain institutionally and culturally distinct from best practice. Uh, the Danish and Swedish economic models in particular remain both highly advanced and more egalitarian on many indices. But there's very small, materially well-endowed and export-focused economies. They possess some remarkable strengths that mean that their distinctive features are likely to enjoy very powerful forms of support in the future. However, there are our movements. Uh, Sweden's economy right now, for example, is starting to sputter a bit, and their Norwegian uh, cousins across the border are a bit not pleased about, well, let's say they're experiencing schadenfreude, that lovely German word, uh, in that there's about half a million Swedes now living in Norway as temporary guest workers. Uh, they're taking the jobs the Norwegians just don't want, and after living next to their more prosperous and larger big brother for a number of years, the Norwegians are enjoying this rather thoroughly. Well, I think that explains what I wanted to talk to you today. Thanks for listening, and I'll be back again very soon. Bye-bye.